And good morning, church family. It's good to be with you in your home and uh, live and ready to worship the Lord together. And today I want to uh, talk to you about being ready. Uh, two weeks ago, Pastor Luke uh, finished up his first Thessalonians, second Thessalonians series on return of the king. And in that, uh, there started to raise up or rise up for me a theme there that he was talking about of being ready. And are we ready? Are we ready for the return of the king? And being ready for the return of the king, it's not just a theory to be discussed. It is actually a truth to be believed that he is coming back. And so being ready, there are five things that the Bible tells us that every believer should be ready to do. Every believer should be ready to do. Now, there are two more things it tells the church board and the church council to be ready to hand out discipline or correction. And then for every pastor and elder, it tells us to be ready in season and out of season. But those are exempt from you. This is five things every Christian should be ready to do. Now, before we unpack these five things, let's pray and ask the Lord to uh, bless our time together. Father, we thank you so much for your worship. We thank you, Lord, that we can bow our hearts and worship you above all things going on in our lives. And Lord, we ask now that you be glorified with our praise, with our hearts, with our readiness, with our preparedness to give you all that we have and to be ready and looking for your return and so, Lord, challenge us, strengthen us, and also uh, help us to encourage one another the way we can as we're separated but yet together. We thank you for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. So the first thing that every Christian should be ready to do is to practice good works. If you have your Bibles, turn to Titus chapter 3. Uh, we're going to read verses 1 through 9. Every Christian should be ready to practice good works. And it says, Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and the loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly, through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying, this saying or the saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. But avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. And right here in Titus uh, 3, 1 through 9, we unpacked, we see that we are to be ready for good works. But oftentimes, as soon as you say good works, people go to two different camps. We think that, oh, I'm saved because of the good works that I've done, like God is going to save me because I'm good. And right here it says, nope. You're not saved because of righteous things that you have done, but you're saved according to God's own mercy by the washing and regeneration of the Holy Spirit. It's not something that you did or can work for. But we are saved to do good works. And so we have these two uh, works that we can understand, we can unpack. We're supposed to be ready for every good work and devoted to every good work. Now let's move on. I'm going to bring out some more scriptures. Colossians 1.10 says it this way. So walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. 
You see, I should be producing the fruit of good works in my Christian walk. I should be following Christ. I should be producing things that glorify him and honor his name. We have another scripture, Ephesians 2.10. It says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now, for some of us, you may have uh, dove into this workmanship. It's more like you are God's poem, and he's writing you out. You are the thing that God has created. But what really blows my mind is that we are created in Christ for good works. That's not what blows my mind. But we're created for Christ and good works. But God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is interesting to me as I could be walking down the road. God has prepared beforehand for me to walk into a good work. And here I think I'm doing something about it. But God has ordained it through Christ to bring him glory and honor. So the next scripture I have is Matthew 5, 16 for this good work. It says, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Did you hear that? Let your light shine before others so they may see your good works, and they give glory to your Father in heaven. Now, understand this. When we are doing good works, we're fruitful, we're bringing God glory, and oftentimes there's two temptations when we do good works. Now, the one temptation is that when I'm doing a good work, and I have pride rise up in me, and I want to tell everybody, look at what I'm doing. And Matthew 5 also says, no, what you're supposed to do is in secret. When you give alms to the poor, you don't announce it. And so there, that's the temptation is when I am doing good, I want to say, hey, look at me. And then there's another temptation that when God wants glory from it, when God wants to shine on the good work that you or I are doing, I want to hide it. And God's like, hey, let, I'm trying to shine my light so others, so there's a double temptation. We got to be careful when God wants to use it, we let him use it. But oftentimes I hear people, I don't want to tell you because I don't want to lose my reward. Well, what if God is wanting this to be known? What if God is wanting to show off his name? So we got to be careful in how we handle these. And I've got, no matter what though, I've got to be ready for that good work no matter how God wants to use it. So I have to guard my pride that I'm not boasting. And then the other one is I also have to be careful to guard my humbleness that I don't let it lead to pride that I'm not going to let God use it and hide it away from him. This reminds me of just this week I had a story uh, to share with you about going to Walmart and Moline, Super Walmart. Got to make that clear. So I'm there because uh, there's a plea to to buy canned goods. The 27 groceries have gone out to the blessing box. We need help. So somebody donated some cash and you, uh, you can't go online and buy bulk items for anything. You have to go to the store. The manager said, you can come in and take all we got, but you can't order it online. So here I'm running into the store. I'm loading up this cart and it's getting pretty high and I'm at the end of the aisle and I'm sitting there with my shopping cart. I got a list of things and dry goods I should be getting with this money. And all of a sudden this guy comes around the corner at the end of the aisle and he just looks at my cart and he goes, ah, man. And he just keeps on walking, looking at my cart. And he's like, what are you doing? Whoa. So I'm sitting there and I've got this big pile, you know, and I'm like, I didn't know what to say. He's looking right at me. He just keeps walking, just looking at me, like shaking his head, like you little hoarder. Well, I'm not little, but you big hoarder. And I said, without even really just thinking about it, is I'm shopping for a food pantry. And he's keeping on walking. And he says from a distance, oh, all right, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, we're still having this conversation. And he's like down at the other end of the aisle and I'm at this end of the aisle and I shout out and we're giving it away for free too. And he goes, and you ought to <laughs> come to the Baptist church of Moline. No, 
that's not what I said. I wanted to say a lot more. But I realized, man, was this a moment God was trying to hide my good work? Is this a moment God was trying to say, hey, let your light shine? And I messed it up. I felt like the whole rest of the shopping trip, now I'm on guard. I'm like, everybody's looking at me. I had to tell the cashier as she breathes, this big, uh, another hoarder. I'm like, it's for a food pantry. So this whole time I'm thinking, man, I should have just kept my mouth shut. Should have been ready to just take whatever they want to throw at me because God and I know what we're doing trying to bear fruit for him, trying to share the love, and you get hackled at Walmart. So the next, the next thing is every Christian should be ready for good works. The next thing is every Christian should be ready to share the gospel. Now this is for my King James lovers out there, or the new King James. It says in Romans 1, 15 and 16, it says, So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. You see, the ESV just says, I am eager to preach the gospel. The New King James says, I'm ready to preach it. Uh, but we have two different Greek words translated here in ready in the King James. It says prepared, which is ready. The other Greek word that it is, is, I can't say it well, but it's prothumos, and it's eager with a ready mind. I am ready in my mind at any moment to preach this gospel. Jesus said it two times in the scripture that the spirit is willing, ready, eager, but the flesh is weak. And Paul says it once, and that's all it is in the New Testament right here. I am ready. I am eager. I am just on the edge of any moment to preach the gospel, to share the gospel, to be truly ready for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, the gospel is to be shared. It is. We are to be ready at any moment. Let's share this gospel. Let's share it out with anybody around us. But the other side of the gospel is that it also is to be walked out by faith. We are to be living the gospel, a gospel walk. And according to Romans 6, 4, it says that we are no longer to walk by the flesh, but we're to walk in the spirit, the new life. We're buried with Jesus and we're resurrected to a new life. We're a living gospel. You see, I've been raised with Jesus to a new life. The gospel walk means that the righteous requirements of the law are fulfilled in me that death has brought sin, or sin has brought death, and I've been united with Christ in his resurrection. The gospel walk. We're not walking according to the flesh. We're walking according to the spirit. And this is every believer not just ready to preach the gospel, but to live it out in front of everyone and they will look at you and think, man, what is, this guy doesn't do what he used to do anymore. This guy is not the same guy. What happened to him? The gospel of Jesus Christ has resurrected him to true life, and he's walking it out with the Lord. The next one is 2 Corinthians 5.17. It says, to be ready to share the gospel. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Not only are you ready to share the gospel and eager in your mind to do so, but living a gospel-filled life, living in the new life, walking with the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that we cannot serve two masters. We got the flesh and the spirit. You'll hate the one and love the other or love the one and hate the other, but you can't have two in fact, uh, in one of my commentaries, there's a story about two architects uh, being interviewed by a whole town. This town wanted a temple in their home, and the first architect got up and was very eloquent, and he spoke about arches and bricks and how they would quarry them and how they would build this building and they would, what mortar they would use, how they would mix it, how it could be beautiful with stained glass and all of this stuff, and he spoke so well, everybody was hanging on his word. 
And that first architect being interviewed uh, finally got done with the speech and he sat down. The second one stood up and all for the interview, all he said is everything that man just said I can do. And he sat down and that man got the job. Because the gospel is not how eloquent we can preach. It's how are we doing it? How are we living it out? How are our actions being invaded by Jesus Christ? Our thought life, our desires, every part of us is being invaded by his Holy Spirit regenerating us to be more and more in the likeness of Jesus Christ. How we're living it out. The next way in which to be ready as we move on. Number three is ready to share the hope. Now, 1 Peter tells us in 1 Peter 3.15, and I'm going to read the verse on the screen, but then I'm going to read more of it. It says, but in your hearts, honor Christ as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. So now I'm going to jump back uh, actually to verse uh, 13 and read that. It says, now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your heart honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. <laughs> Man, if I would have uh, really lived it out in Walmart, I would have just kept my mouth shut and suffered for doing what is good. There's the reward. This is telling us to always be ready to share the hope that is in you. Always being ready. Now, our English word, this is backwards, because usually we talk about the Greek words. The English word for, uh, translated here is apology. From the Greek word, answer. So this doesn't mean, oh, I should be ready to always tell people I'm sorry to those around me. No, an apology is a courtroom word, means you are ready for a defense. So the ESV has it very well done. Be ready for the defense. Apologetics is the defense of the faith. And so every Christian should be able and ready to give a defense of the hope of Christ that is in them. Now here is where it really hits home. We're ready to give the hope even when things are going hopelessly wrong. Did you hear that? Giving the hope of Jesus Christ even when things are going hopelessly wrong or a hopeless situation. You see, because when crisis comes, there's pressure added to our faith and out of it, what's going to come? Are you going to give in to the fear are you going to give in to the wrong choices, the wrong information, the anxiety and the worry and all this temptation coming at you? Or are you going to unite yourself with Christ, trusting God that no matter what, he's got this. A crisis creates an opportunity for a witness. When a believer behaves with faith and hope, unbelievers sit up and take notice. And I often have to remind myself and others, I said it this week at least twice, people going through hard circumstances, I challenge them, I say, even when you don't know what God's hands are forming in this situation, you don't know what God is doing in this circumstance, you don't know what his hands are doing in this, you have to trust his heart. So even when the circumstance is hard and it's pressure and it's, it's diagnosis, it's sickness, it's death, it's loneliness, it's anxiety, all of this coming in, trust his heart that he loved you. He sent Jesus for you to die in your place so that he could have a relationship. So lean on that relationship, lean on his promises that he cares for you, he counts the hairs of your head. He bottles your tears. He knows you more than you can understand and he cares about you. 
So when we don't know what his hands are doing, we always trust his heart. Even when the circumstances overwhelm us, because God's heart is for us. Are you ready to share the hope? So the next, as we move on, number four is to be ready for persecution. Be ready for persecution. In Acts 21, 13, Paul said, or Paul answered, what are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So I know on the screen we have one verse, but out of the context, hopefully I can help. Agabus, a prophet, had been in the area, and he's with Paul, he grabs the belt that Paul owns, and he ties himself up, he starts at his feet, and then he ties his hands up, and he hog ties himself up, and he says, the owner, the Holy Spirit says, the owner of this belt is going to be like this in Jerusalem, is going to be turned over. And that's Paul. And all of a sudden, everybody just starts weeping, and they're like, oh, Paul, don't go, you're going to be tied up. And here's Paul. This is how he answers them. What are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart. I'm ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I love that because tell you what, if you were to tell me I was going to go to Walmart and get tied up and turned over, I wouldn't go. But here's Paul knowing that he is not only ready for the persecution, he's ready to give it all. Every inch of his life, his liberty, his freedom, not only to be bound and imprisoned, but to die for Jesus Christ. In fact, they answered him uh, the following verse, uh, 14. It says, and since Paul would not be persuaded, it says, we ceased and said, let the will of the Lord be done. I think about those circumstances that you might be facing where you would weep and cry and pray and say, let me avoid, let me, let me step around this. But the Spirit of God is challenging us to step through it and to lean on him, to trust his heart, to be ready for that persecution. I like that Paul's just ready. I've got some work to do. So the next one, being ready for persecution, let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. It says, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. The following verse also says, while evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Whew. That's quite a guarantee. You want and desire to live a godly life? you will be persecuted. Oftentimes, the ones that are most painful is by our own family, by the very ones we would call our friends. What, they'll say, what are you doing? Are you crazy? You don't do that anymore? What's the matter with you? I found Jesus. Oh, man. And they look at you weird and look at you like you've lost your marbles but you haven't. You've found true life and you want to share it with them. But the persecution can come, but we need to be ready at any moment. Matthew 5.10 tells us as well, be ready for persecution. It says it this way, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness, for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. It says, rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And understanding that we should be happy to receive persecution. The disciples uh, in, tells us that they were beaten 
for preaching Jesus Christ, and after they received their lashes, they received the beating, it says that they're running away, rejoicing with one another that Jesus counted them worthy to be beaten and to suffer for his name's sake. Challenges my faith. Am I willing? Am I ready for the persecution? Does Jesus count me worthy to suffer with him, to fill up the measure of suffering, as Paul writes to us, that we would know him and we would know the power of his resurrection and be united with him in his death? Suffering on that level, to be ready to give it all, our life, our liberty, for the persecution of Christ. The next one, James 15, 20, be ready for persecution. It says, remember the word that I said to you, a servant, or I said James, it's John, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. This world is trying wholesale to get us to walk in our flesh to walk after those things that are not of the spirit and they're at enmity with one another. The kingdom of light that we've been adopted into, uh, God has rescued us, adopted us out of the kingdom of darkness. And now that we're a child of the light, the whole dark world is trying to get us, pull us back in to keep walking in our flesh. But Christ has brought us true life. There's no other life than the life that Christ has given to us. Are we ready for that persecution that we're shining the light on? The Bible tells us we're shining the light on dark areas and men love the dark and they don't even want to come near the light. That persecution will be right on us who are reflecting that. The next one for being ready, number five, be ready to meet the Lord. In Matthew 24, 44, it says, Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. We don't know when the Lord will return to roll up the sky like a scroll. And look down on the kingdom that he's made. Are we alert? Are we watchful? Are we faithful? Are we ready for him to step on the scene and to see his glory? I think, what if the Lord was actually just coming to your house tonight? Would you change anything that you were doing tonight? If you're ready to meet the Lord and his coming, would anything in your life have to change, or are you ready right now to meet him? Jesus gave us four parables in Matthew right after he talked about the end of the age and the coming in chapter, Matthew chapter 24 and 25. He gave four parables. And each of these parables are about being ready to meet him. The homeowner and the thief is the first one. Well, that one, if you knew when he was coming and he broke in, would you be ready? If you knew when he was coming, the good and the wicked servants. One was ready and the other one was not. The wicked servants started beating the other ones and taking over. The ten virgins, five were ready and five were not ready. They had to go buy oil. And then the talents that one man took what he was given and hid it, didn't use it, wasn't ready. All of these to say, be watchful, be about the work of sharing the gospel, be prepared to wait, <laughs> be using everything that you have. And I often think when I say this, there's always, Peter tells us, there's always these naysayers out there that they've been preaching that, that Jesus is coming for thousands of years. And all these naysayers, right, have to understand that 120 years ago, when they were preaching the same message that be ready, all of those people, there might be two, I think, in the world that are over 120. So all those people, when they heard that preaching, they've met the Lord. We are all going to pass away. We're going to be absent from the body and present with the Lord face to face. We're all going to have to get ready for that meeting. Whether he comes in the air and he rolls the sky up like that scroll or we die and we go and we're face to face with him. 
are you ready? You will meet him. You will have to get yourself ready. The Bible says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. Because we're not promised tomorrow. We're not promised another day. We're, we have this moment. And that might be all some of us have. And I think about after uh, sharing being ready and watching and waiting for him to come. My kids and I have this game. Uh, when we're at the store and we drop mom off and she goes in. We go around to the parking lot where we can see all of the doors. And this game becomes everybody picks a number of what is the number of people that it will take before mom comes out, right? And when we got the car, we're ready, we're eager, we're just watching the door, and whoever wins usually gets a prize, uh, and the other ones don't, so I usually win. Um, but <laughs> we're watching the door, and we're just eager, we're just watching, waiting. Is that one mom? Oh, no, what color shirt did she, she have? She had a pink shirt. Okay, that's, okay. All right, we're at... 18, 19, we're all counting, we're all counting. And it passes the time, and two hours later after she comes out, we've played this game a few times, uh, here she is. And I just know all that moment to start the engine, to go get her. I think about the same thing, just is this the moment? Is Jesus stepping on stage? Is this it? Is this the moment? Are you ready and eager? But while we're waiting... We need to be ready for good works. We need to be ready to share the gospel. We need to be ready for the hope that we have in us to share it. We need to be ready for the persecution. And above all, be watchful, be ready for his appearing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you for the challenge of your word that is how we get ready, Lord, how our hearts are longing to see you, how this world is groaning for your return. And so, Lord, we just ask that you let it be centuries away because it's not how bad it gets, Lord, it's how many more can you save from the kingdom of darkness to bring into the kingdom of your light through the gospel. And so, Father, as your children, let us be ready to share that message, to live that message, to share the hope that we are ready for your kingdom now, living it out now, your Holy Spirit in us, bearing fruit, doing good works, bringing glory to your name, showing this earth your will as it is in heaven, Lord, that it's being done now on earth. And so we thank you, Lord, for this hope that we have. Help us to settle in our hearts Jesus as holy. Set apart one true God, our master, Jesus Christ, reigning and ruling in our hearts. And so, Lord, help us all for that first step of preparation to first be adopted into your family, family to be rescued on a soul level by your Holy Spirit, Lord. And, Father, we thank you that your heart, that your throne is in our heart, Lord that you are ruling and reigning on earth as it is in heaven, your will being done in our life. We love you. We thank you for the opportunity to call you Father. Help us to bring you glory and to have our hearts ready and willing to serve you at any moment. In Jesus' name, amen.